America. This is Andrea Wagslin, Executive Director for Green Space, the Cambria Land Trust. I am extremely excited to present this webinar to you today. We have a lot of really great information coming your way, but also because this is our inaugural webinar. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenters. Wayne Atto, he's one of our board members and past president of Green Space for 17 years, and also John Seed. He's our volunteer curator. Wayne has had an incredible career teaching and writing about architecture at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. He has also served on the Milwaukee Historic Landmark Commission. He is the author of seven books on topics ranging from architecture and urban design to the history of green space. We're also very thrilled to have John Seed. John Seed is a professor emeritus of art and art history. He recently retired after teaching at Mount Jacinto College for over 30 years. He has an ongoing interest in Asian art and culture and is currently developing feature articles for Sotheby's Asia and Arts of Asia magazine. His current topics include writing about modern artists after World War I in the U.S. He and his family have lived in Canberra for around two years and it's been a dream of his family to live here. Thanks, Andrea. I'm really pleased to, to be able to let you know something about this little recognized aspect of local history. And boy, I'm, I'm pleased to be here to see how this format works for us and uh, to have the chance to work with Wayne. Should be good. I'm going to start with a quotation from a Chinese American about 40 years ago. He said, sure, things were tough on the early Chinese immigrants like my father, but you must remember that compared with life in China, America was the land of opportunity, the golden mountain. In the 19th century, China was in turmoil with civil unrest, floods, famines, and droughts. America offered chances to work, to financially support the family in China, and to accumulate funds to return to China better off. The first record of Chinese immigrants to California is in 1848, the time of the gold rush. Someone realized there was a need for cheap labor in California, and the mechanisms were created to bring men, principally men, from China to work. Twenty years later, there were over 50,000 immigrants. Anti-Chinese sentiment developed within a couple of decades because they would work for less than Americans and were seen as stealing jobs. Many of the Chinese did not try to acculturate, that is, didn't, didn't try to adopt American practices and values because there was an expectation that they would actually return to China, to their home villages and families. Now, locally, uh, Chinese were established as fishermen in the Monterey area by 1854. Some of them drifted down the coast and settled in isolated spots uh, along the coast uh, in the San Simeon area and in what would become uh, Cambria. Cambria didn't exist yet. Along the coast, they farmed sea lettuce and dried abalone. They would ship the sea lettuce back to San Francisco and then on to China. You can see in the illustration here, drawing in a photograph, at low tide, they would uh, go into the water and select rocks with good wave action and sun and scorch them with pine shavings. You can see on the left the rock that uh, the artist has shown. Scorching them discouraged other algae from growing on the rocks and allowed the sea lettuce to attach. After harvesting it, they would dry it naturally in a shallow frame and ultimately bundled the sea lettuce into 40 pound bales for shipment. For the most part, these were men that lived and worked here, scattered along the coast in isolated positions, some distance from one another's turf. This photo was taken a hundred years later from what I've been talking about. This is Hao Wong, possibly the last Chinese who worked in this way on the coast. He was born in San Francisco, began living here at age 15, 
and stayed here until 1974. And this shows his home and drying yard. He had a wife and they had had six children who were attended the local school in Cambria. He was preceded on this uncle. There's a Chinese presence here for about a hundred years. And the location for this actually was uh, just north of Cayucas in a place called China Point. To give a context, there were other Chinese immigrants in the region. Most notably, they were working on the Southern Pacific Rail Connection from the south to San Luis Obispo. And importantly, quicksilver was discovered locally in 1871. A number of sites were developed to mine cinnabar, which was then burned to precipitate mercury, which was called quicksilver. This is a photo of a man named A. Louis, who arrived in San Luis Obispo to set up a business supplying Chinese laborers on contract to various projects. They earned much less than local citizens, and among the projects he staffed was the oceanic mine east of Cambria. You can see it here, as many as 200 Chinese worked there as brick makers, miners, cooks, and general laborers. Several decades later, a mine cave-in trapped 20 Chinese who were never recovered. After that, Chinese would not work underground, but continued to work in the mines as cooks and at the furnaces where the cinnabar was heated. So to summarize, locally Chinese worked quite independently on the coast as farming sea lettuce, and others worked as parts of crews in the mines. Now here we have a, a map of Cambria is pretty much as it is now. Let me orient you. Uh, you see Main Street um, at the top, and then Bridge Street over here. Uh, you can see it with my uh, the arrow. Uh, and then here is Center Street. Um, this is Burton Drive. Uh, the, the current post office is ro located right about uh, where my uh, pointer is. The property that we're going to be talking about is this one that's uh, hatched in. It had a, sh a narrow uh, exposure on Center Street, and it opened up into what's called a flag lot. And totally, it's uh, 1.6 uh, acres. Now, this is a view from what we call Lodge Hill. Uh, you can see Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa Chapel up there. So we're looking down from Lodge Hill. Santa Rosa Chapel is there. Uh, just for in interest, this over building over here on the right is um, what's the first store in Cambria. Um, the future post office site is here. So maybe you can orient this in your mind. And right next to that is the current uh, parking lot. And Center Street is here. Um, and this house, um, we're, we're going to keep track of this location. This was a house called the Roth, uh, Rothschild Gans Home. Um, and this property became eventually the Chinese Center. When Chinese in the area had time uh, away from farming the sea lettuce and mining, they could gather here. Uh, on this site where I'm pointing, uh, to celebrate, to do business, to gamble, to have letters written, and whatever. Typical celebrations among Chinese in California were the Lunar New Year, Spring Festival, Autumn Festival, and twice monthly lunar celebrations. Chinese New Year was celebrated over several days, uh, with as many as 50 to 60 folks there at the center for the whole time. Pigs were purchased from ranchers, as were chickens, and it said that food was spread on a long table in front of the building. There was rice wine and nonstop gambling. And the building that they referred to 
is what we now um, believe was the Chinese temple. Here we have a map from 1886 showing pretty much the same area, but it's, it's upside down just to simplify the, everybody's orientation. So here we have Main Street, and here we have Bridge Street. Uh, the bottle shop is there, though at the time that was the Proctor Hotel. Blue buildings in these maps are were made of stone. The uh, yellow colored ones uh, were made of wood frame. And the X on the building means it was a shed. Now these maps were from the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company. They were created to simplify the, uh, the sale of property insurance against fire. And they are a great resource now for historians. In addition to what the buildings are made of, there's other information as well, as long, uh, including how many window panes. So those, a portion of the Chinese Center here on Center Street. This is the house that I pointed out, the lost child house. And then here we see um, the map indicating that there are three Chinese buildings there. A few years later, same area, a couple of things have changed. Over here, this is a Chinese laundry that has been built. Um, this is a drying platform associated with the, uh, the laundry. Um, and down here, we see buildings. Uh, this is a Chinese laundry here on the, the property that we are talking about. And right next to it is a building that's called Chinese. Um, and it is undoubtedly, it is the first evidence of the Chinese temple on the property. It is a, a little confusing because th this building is has two rooms, whereas the temple uh, that we know now has one room. And this is a longer building than the current, so that remains something that historians, um, I hope, can clarify. Let me show you um, something that mo I, I was not aware of. Here we are on Bridge Street, and this is where the parking lot of the post office currently is. Now, Bridge Street used to continue and then it went down the embankment and it crossed as a ford, crossed over Santa Rosa Creek, and it continued up uh, in the Arroyo where the current highway is, but on the other side of the canyon, um, near where the, the current nursery is located. You know, Wayne, if I can, if I can jump in with sure. a question, yep. can we see the current green space reserve on this map? Yes. Uh, thanks for asking that. This is the entrance to the reserve on uh, Center Street. We walk through our parking lot here. This, there is no building there anymore, and this is where um, the uh, the entrance gate is located, and. The remainder of the property is down here. And I'll just give you a little heads up that the temple is going to eventually show up here. It moves over the course of history. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Here we have another view from, this is up near where the, the current nursery. See a fellow over here on the left enjoying the view. Just for your information, I hear in the a little farther back, that's the first school that Cambria had, the first building for a school. And here, ew, it's a little hard to see, but here's where you can see how Bridge Street dropped down into the creek bed, and that was where people crossed. Oh, and another thing over here. This is where I showed you the Chinese, there was a Chinese laundry, you see, and the platform for drying, you see underneath it, it's held up by these framing timbers. And this is 1895. What's changed here is the size and orientation of the temple. 
On this map, it's called a Joss house. It's slightly changed in orientation and has the dimensions of, of what the current building are. The name Joss House was used throughout California to describe these buildings and uh, Chinese settlements. Um, it's based on a Portuguese word for Deus or God. It's considered a pejorative term now. Joss was meant incense. Joss sticks were made of Joss. This is, I think, my final map to show you the, this is 1913, and here the orientation is, again, Center Street up here, and now we have a different house. This is no longer the Rothschild house. This is another house with a hip roof, and we'll see more of that as we move through the images. And here is the Chinese temple is identified again, and this has changed its orientation. These are two more Chinese buildings that are identified. This property that the Chinese used as their China center was owned by a widow named Mrs. Joanna Gans, a former Cambria resident who was then living in San Francisco. We don't know if she charged a rent for the use of the site. On this site, in addition to what you see, there were cabins, bunkhouses, laundries, as we've seen, an opium den, and a building that's been identified in several ways. We've been calling it the Chinese temple, but it's been called the Joss House. Historians say that maybe we should call it an assembly hall because it had more uses than religious. It had fraternal uses as well, and another name for it would be Association Hall. Main Street is here coming in from the left. This in the street in the front is what we now call Burton Drive. This is the Squib House that I'm pointing to here. Over here we have the hip roof house that I mentioned on the property and over here facing the creek is the Chinese temple in at that particular time. It's said that the relations between Cambrians and the local Chinese were cordial and even caring and that was the opinion of Geneva Hamilton historian. In Cambria, there were few Chinese women, as Chinese women were generally prohibited from immigrating to the U.S. A woman that was called Chinese Mary resided at the center, that's back over here. She resided there in the 1890s and 1900s. She reportedly looked after the welfare of young unmarried men, many in their teens, who came to the center. Here's a, a wonderful image of a couple of the Chinese young men bringing a pig out of an oven. This is undoubtedly the Chinese New Year celebration, possibly spring, but because there are no leaves on these trees, I think it's probably winter. That's an, a eucalyptus tree in the background. The pig has been basted to create a lacquer-like coating. It's a classic Chinese preparation. The occasion, as I said, was probably Chinese New Year. I can't determine the exact location of it, but it's undoubtedly close to the Chinese center. You know, and, and Wayne, just to mention something, I'm just so tempted to think he's wearing Levi's because <laughs> look at the cuffs. Right, and look at the label. I know those were minor pants, uh, you know, at the end of the 19th century. Anyways, maybe that's a possibility. Uh, well, a uh, good observation. I was very pleased to discover that um, actually Levi's were first um, marketed in 1870. This actually has been identified the brand. It's a different brand from Levi's. Basically, the, the same idea. This fellow over here on the left is holding up the wooden tray that the pig will go on. The hats that they're wearing are commodious enough to hold 
the cues that they had, that is the pigtail. Pigtails were, or cues were, had been required by the Manchu dynasty in China when they conquered China in the 17th century, and it was considered a crime not to wear one. So the cue in these pictures actually can tell us something about the uh, degree of commitment or expectations that these men had uh, regarding the future. Because if they cut their cue off, that would be considered a crime in China, and it would indicate that they probably were not expecting to return to China. You know, Wayne, in a, in a book I've been reading called Gold Mountain, about the Chinese coming to California, one of the historical characters off his cue at the time of the revolution because his wife says to him, the Manchus aren't in power anymore, you can go ahead and take that off. That's exactly a great example. And the, the kind of freedom that this declared when they were, were free of the uh, Manchus. This is another a couple of different young men here carrying a pig. And again, it looks like it's winter. The building that I've been calling a temple or a joss house, I mentioned that historians think that maybe it m might better be called an association hall because it was probably a branch of the Qi Kung Tong. Tong buildings were typically painted red in California. The Tong was one of many fraternal societies that provided Chinese living in the United States with aid. It was established 200 years earlier as an anti-Manchu organization. In the United States, the Qi Kung Tong provided services to members regardless of kinship or birthplace, so any Chinese in the vicinity could join. By 1870s and 90s, practically every Chinese community in the U.S. had a branch of this or a comparable organization. It was sometimes called the Chinese Freemasons, although there was no formal connection to Masons. Occasionally, signs would be placed on the Chinese buildings saying Chinese Freemasons, and it's thought that this might deter vandalism. We don't have any evidence that, that was the case in Cambria, but it certainly was the case elsewhere. Do we know much about the region of China that our local Chinese came from? Yes, historians say that they came from southern China, in particular Guangdong province, which is where Canton is now. They spoke Cantonese, and that, that's what historians have discovered. Christine Heinrichs here. Let's see what our questions are. Yeah, the question I was going to ask is I was very interested okay. in the connection to clothing, and I wondered if you've conferred with Levi's or other clothing sellers from that time, if they might have some additional material in their archives. That's a great idea, and I'm going to put it on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> um, wh what I know about the clothing is from a researcher, an authority on the Chinese in a in California, and so I rely just really totally on on what I've learned from him. So that, I'm going to try to find out more about it. That's worth looking into, and I want to mention something kind of sobering, maybe not directly related to our community, but did you see in the news that there's a major museum of Chinese history, Chinese immigrant history in New York that had a fire a week ago and lost 85,000 items? So this no. history is, is precious. You'll, if you go in the news, you'll read about it. But something like half of their collection was digitized. So there are archives, and uh, that website, the Museum of the Chinese in America in New York, may be a good place to go for all of us to learn more about uh, clothing. A, a question from D. Lance. Do we have any ancestors of the early Chinese living in Cambria today? Wayne, I don't think so. No, we do not. I mentioned that Chinese women were in large part prohibited from immigrating. Also, Chinese couldn't own property. With a couple of exceptions, we didn't have 
families that became established here. For the most part, they moved on. I'll mention this a little later in the second decade of the 20th century and move on to work elsewhere. And Wayne, I'm seeing a question from Bob Reed. Are there artifacts from where they lived? And I'm, I'm going to reframe that question a little bit. Do we have any local archaeology? Have we found any locations of buildings? Have there been excavations? Have we brought up any Chinese items locally? I guess I'd say, unfortunately, no. There is a an old well on the site, which was filled in. And we, I rather hoped that when archaeologists investigated that, that they would find some remnants of this period, but that was not the case. For the most part, I'd say that no, we do not have. All right, well, those were some good questions. We're going to have another question session coming up in a few minutes, and we'll let Wayne take things a, a little bit further now. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next image, which is an aerial view of the what we call the East Village. Here we're looking down from the area above Lodge Hill. This is Main Street. This is Bridge Street coming down there. This is Center Street. And the 1.6 acre property that we call that was called the Chinese Center begins here on Center, uh, Center Street and then comes back and then it broadens out into this. This property came on the market in 1999. It had commercial, it's this property I'm talking about, um, it had commercial zoning so it could have been developed in that way. The county also had discussed purchasing it to make a parking lot. Green space, Cambria Land Trust was interested in preserving its natural character and habitat for animals. It also has plum trees, apple and walnut trees, wild blackberries. Fortunately, through the generosity of a longtime supporter, we were able to purchase the property, make a commitment to, to buy it. It took a number of years for us to clean up the property to make it safe for public use. Uh, this shows a view toward uh, all these trees are in along the Santa Rosa Creek embankment. That hip roof house that I've been pointing out a couple of times, that became a quirky addition to our purchase. We became responsible for that as well as the open space. At the back here, over here, this is the Chinese temple that we've been watching move around on the site. This build, I'll say a little more about that in a moment, but as you, you can see this uh, building and a third one uh, behind it that we can't see were not maintained. And so by the time Greenspace bought the property and became owners of this building, it was beyond saving. This helps explain what happened there on the site. This is the hip roof building that we saw on facing Center Street. We had a glimpse of the temple here. The Warrens moved the temple from its original site closer to Santa Rosa Creek and added it to this house. And this became their living room. They cut these windows in it and a door that you can't see in order to make it more livable. This building here was brought from elsewhere in Cambria and it became the kitchen. And this all happened after about 1916. The Chinese left Cambria probably for a number of reasons. The Chinese Revolution had happened in 1911. And so the Manchus were gone. So there was a, a, a sense of a new era in China. Also, there had been some anti-Chinese sentiment elsewhere in the county. Then again, the market for mercury was unpredictable and mines opened and closed periodically. So the property was sold to William Warren in 1919 and as I mentioned, the temple was moved from its earlier site here in 1925-26.
most of the site where buildings were labeled Chinese, most of the buildings there, they disappeared. The only part of, and I mentioned that we had to, uh, we had to tear down the this building and also this one because um, they could not be saved. But fortunately, the temple building was still sound. And we learned at the time that it was, in fact, one of only five Chinese temples left in California from the 19th century. The others are all north of Sacramento. John, do you want to say something about the other temples in California? You know, I do, and uh, what I'd like to do, I want to give a little bit of context and a little bit of color. I want to go back in time into the 19th century and, and uh, talk history a bit. Just to get started, since being involved with the temple here in Cambria, just doing personal research to learn more about uh, the history of other structures in California. And I think the first thing that really, really is striking to me is I've come to understand the anti-Chinese sentiment of the 19th century. I'm going to read you a quote just to give you some flavor for this. Uh, when Rutherford Hayes, who was the 19th president of the United States, was running in 1876, here's a snippet from one of his speeches. He says, our present experience in dealing with the weaker races, with Negroes and Indians, is not encouraging. I would consider with favor any suitable measures to discourage Chinese from coming to our shores. So, I mean, that sets a little bit of the stage. And then something else I've been uh, reading about, there's some very good material on the web. I started reading about uh, Chinatown in the 1880s and 1890s in San Francisco. And in talking about Chinatown, you want to remember that the great earthquake and then the fires of 1906 destroyed a great deal of the city, including doing considerable damage in Chinatown. But in the 1880s, in the 1890s, there were a number of Joss houses in San Francisco. You know, I'm using the perjurative term, but uh, they were big attractions for tourists. And if you read uh, some of the uh, reactions that the tourists had to the Joss houses, people often found them shocking. And what they found shocking about them is they compared them to Christian houses of worship. And they wondered, well, why weren't there regular services? with a bell that rang in a tower calling people to uh, worship. And why was it if you went into a Jost house, there would be a priest who might try to sell you incense? You know, apparently there was commerce uh, going on in these uh, places. And of course, they were, uh, you know, often slack-jawed uh, at what they found in the interior of these places. And now we have up on the screen, we have some of the altars of the Weaverville Joss house. I am going to read you a quote this is from a magazine. This is what a journalist wrote in 1878 after visiting a San Francisco uh, Joss house. He described the looming figures of three mighty gods, bizarre and bedizened with stiff brocades, their hideously carved expressionless heads vaguely dim in the upper murky shadows. <laughs> Now, the dramatic emphasis is mine. I got Wayne to laugh. But, uh, you know, we think we understand that in Cambria, there's one recollection that there very likely was a at least one gold deity, probably a Taoist uh, statue of Guandi. And uh, we can only speculate at some of the items, some of the carvings and brocades and scrolls and altarpieces that might have been found inside the uh, the temple in Cambria. All right, I also want to say something about the other temples that are open in California. I think many of you have been inside our local Cambria temple, but if you've been inside or if you haven't, you'll want to know that there really is no original material. Uh, what we have are donated items that are, you know, from that era or at least of, of interest in Chinese history. The scroll that hangs over the altar is actually, uh, I think, uh, Nepalese, so it's uh, you know not the right culture technically, but we do have a display inside the temple. I hope that someday in the future, we might be able to possibly borrow some antiques to uh, to bring to the temple. But there are three Chinese temples available in California. Again, uh, the major temples in California or in San Francisco perished in the 1906 earthquake. But you can go to the Bak Kai Temple and Museum in Marysville, 
which goes all the way back to uh, 1854 and was dedicated to the uh, warrior Zhuang Yu, a deity associated with the north and with rain. First location was uh, destroyed by fire in 1880, but the current structure, the structure that came later, has been preserved by the, by the local community and it's a designated California historical landmark. In Oroville, there's a Chinese temple museum that consists of three temple rooms going back to the 1870s, and that community has added the exhibition gallery, they've reconstructed a store, a miner's hut, and they've also added a courtyard uh, garden. We understand that there were as many as 3,000 Chinese in, in Oroville as early as 1864. And when you go there, they have Taoist deities, including Guan Di, who we think may have been the patron deity of the Cambria Temple. And then finally, the, the Weaverville Joss House and State Historic Park. It's the oldest continuously used Chinese temple in California, built in 1874 as a replacement for a temple that had burned. And it's still a place of worship, and by contacting the caretaker there, in the recent insider sent out to you, there are email contacts and phone contacts. You can set up to take a tour uh, Thursday through Sunday. And I know that's something I'm hoping to do this spring or summer, is get up uh, further north in California and tour some of these locations. All right, we have another moment for uh, questions. And Wayne, if you had to uh, characterize the style of architecture of the building here in, in Cambria, of our temple, how would we characterize it? Well, it's described as vernacular, which means basically commonplace or widely used. It's not distinguished by particular uh, stylistic elements. It's the style that lots of buildings were built in in the 19th century because it was uh, the cheapest and easiest to do. And that makes it quite different from the temples that you've been talking about in Northern California, which are much richer in the way they've been developed. You know, it must have reflected the economic reality of our local community. And uh, also, I've heard uh, some people say that some of the Chinese temples, because of the anti-Chinese sentiment, they wanted the building somewhat discreet on the outside, maybe not mm -hmm. overly marked or, or decorated. That could be the case. Let's go to the uh, final portion, Wayne. Okay, I'm going to talk about the restoration of the temple, and uh, and we'll talk about the future. The construction technique, I mentioned that it was simple. It's referred to as box and strip. It's made with uh, long boards like this, uh, vertical planks that were nailed to a plate on top and a sill on the bottom. The cracks between the planks were battens like this I'm pointing to. So there were no structural framing members for a building like this. The method uses minimum amount of wood, and it was popular in the Western states beginning in the late 19th century because it was economical. Monterey pine was used here in Cambria, and it's interesting coincidence that green space has been working diligently in the last couple of decades to protect and expand this rare Monterey pine forest. We lifted the temple portion up off of a rather unsteady, unstable foundation and secured it on girders for a while until we could raise the money to continue the restoration project. Uh, you'll notice this is a piece of particle board that was nailed over one of the windows in order to keep rain out. To purchase the property, a number of supporters pledged help with paying in the mortgage. To move the building and restore it, we sold inscribed bricks for the patron path, and we held a joint celebration with the Cambria Historical Society that we called East Meets West. Our Chinese area was east, and they had cowboys across the street at the Historical Society. We also had a festival called Chinatown on Center Street, and then we've had a lot of other events as well. Uh, this was the mortgage burning ceremony. One of our supporters generously offered to pay off the mortgage, and 
this was the place that we actually burned the mortgage, <laughs> and it was a great a great occasion. We hired archaeologists and architectural historians to then develop a restoration plan for the temple. We moved the temple closer to where it had originally started, it faces east and it faces water. This reflects the principles of feng shui. We couldn't return it to the original site that we saw on maps because that now is declared a flood zone. We restored the exterior, the interior, and made it ADA and compliant. And at each step, we paused to raise the money. This shows you the interior at the time that we purchased the building. This here was the altar, but you recall that the Warrens had uh, cut windows in order to make it more livable. So that's the window, one of the two windows. So this is the altar. That's actually the model that we saw earlier. There are windows, there's a window here, that window, and over on the right, is, can't, I can't see it, but it, there's a door, and then there are these cabinets on both sides and under the altar. It might have had two candles, this is the altar, it might have had two candles, candlesticks, and a rectangular bowl, incense bowls, and a pair of vases for flowers. That's what historians have suggested. Uh, note that the interior is all whitewash. Once we started the restoration, the whitewash was removed. It took a lot of effort to do that. This is what uh, we ended up with. This is uh, the original paint that was found under the whitewash. It's interesting that this color here, which is a lighter color blue, that actually, the, the restorers say that that was the original color of the interior. It's turned this color from exposure or oxidation. And this shows you the, the way that that window was filled in. This is beadboard that was a custom made for us out of redwood, and it matches finish on the interior. The restoration was done by a marvelous couple of conservation of ancient art. They did an extraordinary job with this. Here's the east-facing wall of the interior with the double doors. Those doors are the original. The hardware is the original. And this shows you what it looked like when we had removed the whitewash, but prior to actual restoring. This shows you the wall after the restoration. Here we see a comparison on the left, the way the altar looked at the time that we acquired the property, and here is the way the altar area looks now. So, here is the restored temple. <laughs> the chief alterations from what it originally was were the ramp on the left, here and the porch was increased in depth in order to accommodate wheelchairs. Notice that there are two rocks here under the building. Those were supports for the original building on its previous site. Here we have wonderful occasion. The, this is the opening day for the restored temple. A great event that afternoon. Green Space seeks to attract more people to enjoy the natural qualities of this parcel and to consider the lone reminder of Cambria's Chinese heritage. We've had art festivals and concerts, most recently an Earth Day celebration in partnership with Soto's True Earth Market. Cal Poly Lion Dance Team has been with us on a number of occasions. Two decades ago, Green Space acquired this beautiful open space, and with it, the quirky building, which turned out to harbor a rare piece of Cambria history. It's unique in the southern half of California, and it evidences 
Cambria's role in this region's Chinese American history, we dreamed about having the temple acknowledged more broadly. We're currently seeking to have it declared an official California place of historic interest. And John, I'd like you to tell us something about what the future is and how we hope to involve more people and have a wider audience for this treasure. Absolutely, I'll take it from there. And I want to mention, I do notice we have questions from Oliver and Amy, so we'll get to those. But really quickly, let me say something about the future of the temple. The image you see now on the screen is a program we had in May at Heritage Days. We invited Nan Ray, who is a Pasadena-based Chinese-style brush painter who often demonstrates at the Huntington Library and Gardens. We invited her to come up and she did free demonstrations in the temple and that's what you're seeing in, in front of you. She also did some paid workshops through the Cambria Center for the Arts and got a very, very positive response to both sets of events. She's very personable, sense of humor. She was working with, you know, groups of five or six people. So it was very, very intimate and very, very, uh, just, it was delightful. And it allowed Green Space to ask the question, can we do more so cultural events in the temple? And I'll tell you some ideas we have. One thing we're talking about is the possibility of showing films in the temple. All of this we're going to be doing with, of course, respecting the temple, making sure we're not going to damage anything, that we don't have to displace anything as we do this. But we wonder if we might be able to have uh, films or videos on view in the temple so that as uh, people came through, they could stop by and uh, watch something. So we've talked about that. We're also talking about the, the possibility of having more events along the line of Nan Ray, maybe having a Chinese calligrapher or a carver or even small scale music events. And finally, we might be able to hang Chinese style scrolls. Those are some of the things we're talking about for the future of the temple. And with that, Wayne, I want to go to these uh, two questions we have. The first is from Oliver, and I think I know a little bit of the answer. Do we know the percentage of the Cambrian population made up by Chinese immigrants? And Wayne, have I heard that we had uh, as many as 200 in this area at, at one point? Well, that is an estimate of the, the number of uh, men that were working in the, at the oceanic mine. Got it, okay. Um, the number of immigrants in Cambria changed over the course of three decades. So it's hard to, uh, and the census was not done frequently, so it's, it's hard to match those. Do we have some population figures for the 19th century for the well, whole town? We know that uh, when the post office was established in 1866, that uh, you couldn't have a post office unless you had at least 50 residents. I said a little earlier during the festivals at the Chinese Center, there may have been 50 or 60 people that were staying there full time. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't be specific about the proportion. The second question is an interesting one. Uh, the question from Amy, do we know the history of Chinese immigrants and the Hearst family? For example, Chinese miners working in the Hearst owned mines or Chinese laborers working at Hearst Castle. And Amy, I love that question partly because it was Hearst newspaper in the era that really promoted the byline of the Yellow Peril. Uh, Hearst newspapers were so known as being anti-Chinese. He used Google, I'm going to pass this on to Wicken, to find out if George Hearst, to find out if, if the father had uh, Chinese workers in his silver mines. That seems likely to me. Uh, it's a great question, and unfortunately I don't have uh, the answer. I don't know the answer. I but mean, given, given that Hearst Castle, construction of the castle started in 1919, so we know that at least here in Cambria local, we think our Chinese had mainly left. Right, that's, that's the evidence, right. Uh, but the, their availability to work uh, earlier in previous decades uh, certainly was possible. I have n uh, no knowledge of that, and it's, I'm gonna put that also on my list of things I need to investigate. You know, to go sideways from that a little bit, uh, one of the main projects that brought Chinese immigrants was the building of the Central Pacific uh, Railroad. And that began in January of 1863. There were two to 3,000 Chinese rail workers, and that was completed in 1869. And then what happened in 1870, uh, when, by the way, 70% of California's population was male, there was a depression 
in which 30% of Californians lost their jobs. And, you know, tying that to what Wayne said about the mercury mine, the cinnabar mine, anyone who got a job in the mine in 1871, Chinese or otherwise, probably felt very fortunate to have the work because the railroad work was mainly over. And it looks like we have one more question from D. Lance. There are records of Chinese laborers installing railroad ties to make it possible for transportation by the products of the mining ventures. And I guess, but that's framed as a, as a question. Do we know anything about that, about installing railroad ties? Well, I certainly don't, I'm sorry to say. As far as I know, there were, <laughs> would not have been any railroad ties in the vicinity of Cambria. And unfortunately, my, my knowledge is quite limited in that respect. But certainly that would be the case in San Luis and, and South. Great, okay. Wayne, do you know, was it common to move one building and to add it to another building? And we bring this up because that's what happened to the Chinese temple. It was added to a ranch house that uh, was built, I guess, in the 1920s. Do you think that was a common practice? Um, it apparently was. Uh, materials would have been expensive, uh, so reusing a building wasn't difficult. They, I would say that in many cases the foundations were not complicated, so moving the building, a small building, would not have been such a, a great undertaking. I think it probably had to do with the cost. It was less expensive to move the building than to build a new one. Well, I know just talking about all of this, what it's done for me is it's given me uh, 20 more questions I'd like to research. There's so much more to learn. And I also want to do something as we bring the webinar to an end. I want to mention that uh, very recently, the Temple Fund got a donation from the Sam Francis Foundation. And the Sam Francis Foundation is an artist estate. If any of you are interested in making a donation, even a very small one, even a very modest donation, you can see on the uh, screen, you can use that URL, greenspacecambria.org webinars. When you go there, there's a handy uh, donate button for anything you'd like to send. And the funds that uh, you donate are going to be used for maintaining the temple and also for any future programs. John Seed, Wayne Apto, I just want to thank you so much for contributing to this webinar. I have learned a ton <laughs> and it's, it's always just completely fascinating uh, to learn this little known history about Cambria. If you haven't been to the Chinese temple yet, John Seed is our volunteer curator and so if you would like to book a tour of the Chinese temple, you can call the office. We have the, the phone number listed on the screen or shoot us an email and then we'll connect you to schedule a time if you have family coming into town or you personally just, just want to take a look. Greenspace also has a wonderful resource library. If you want to learn more about Chinese heritage in Cambria and the greater slow area, we have some wonderful resources here, which you're always um, welcome to check out um, at the office. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, again, thank you so much, Wayne. Thank you, John. Have a great day.